All right. Anyway, here, here is uh, Kelly on uh, boycott, divestment, and sanctions. Awesome. Thank you. Um, well, so as many of you guys all know, um, I kind of got involved in all of this in 2007 um, through the Presbyterian Church. Um, so that is the denomination that I am a part of. I first got introduced to the Israel-Palestine issue through Rick Uffercheeks, who was the, well, he is the executive director of the Presbyterian Peace Fellowship, but in 2004, he was elected moderator of the General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church. And so, kind of, as I go through this story, um, I'm gonna kind of be interjecting a lot of various things that have happened over the past 10 years um, through a lens of General Assembly. Um, which is like the Synod, you know, it's the overarching, I'm gonna come down here, I don't know why I'm standing up tall. Um, it's the overarching um, meeting of the Presbyterian Church USA, their denomination, they meet every two years. And this is what just happened in 2014 with the big divestment vote. So um, to kind of start, I'm gonna let you all know this too. Um, this, is, this presentation comes through MRTI, which is the Mission Responsibility Through Investment Committee of the Presbyterian Church. So this is kind of going to be talking about their process because they were the ones that ultimately, I would say it's been their report and their study that has ultimately led to the Presbyterian Church voting for divestment. So um, in 2004, that was when the General Assembly received their like first overture um, calling for divestment, specifically from Caterpillar. And at this time, the General Assembly initiated the MRTI process. Um, and so the General Assembly approved several measures opposing, the Israeli, opposing Israeli occupation of Palestine, including a call to gather data in support of a selective divestment of stocks in multinational corporations doing business with Israel, a strategy suggested by Mitri Rahib, because he was a visitor at that General Assembly. Um, he challenged the commissioners to do more than just issue another statement, do something. And so as a result, the GA initiated the MRTI investment, or the MRTI corporate engagement process, um, but the press misinterpreted this um, as a boycott of Israel. And so ever since then, the Presbyterian Church has been kind of having to push back, um, saying that no, we are not calling for a blanket boycott of Israel. We are specifically looking at corporations that are profiting from unpeaceful pursuits. Um, so then in 2005, the Presbyterian Church is trying to deal with this, this press and they're trying to respond to that. At the same time, the call for BDS comes out of Palestinian civil society. And then in 2006, this is, in 2004, this is also the first year where the PCUSA stopped meeting annually and their General Assembly started meeting every two years. So the next assembly was in 2006, and the assembly set a church policy that financial investment of the Presbyterian Church as they pertain to Israel, Gaza, East Jerusalem, and the West Bank be invested in only peaceful pursuits. So this was where we started seeing that difference between the divest versus invest language. People were uncomfortable with divest, it was being interpreted as a blanket boycott divest of all of Israel. So they wanted to move to this direct investment in Palestine. Um, and I think we've all heard of this process. Can, am I standing in the way? Can you guys not? Okay. And so then in 2008, there was another General Assembly and we started getting tons and tons more overtures coming in. Um, MRTI wasn't at a point yet where they were ready to call for a divestment. Um, but they, because they believed that there was still change that was possible. Um, but GA agreed to wait for the MRTI process to play out while at the same time approving the Amman call. So you can see that the denomination was kind of struggling. Like they, they adopted the Amman call, they believed in the call from the Palestinian Christians. But I think it's always that piece of what about our Jewish friends? We need to be careful because we don't want to affect that relationship because we've been working so hard to build up these inner religious dialogue groups that we don't want to do anything to jeopardize that. Um, so there was a really big, it's very warm right here, there was a really big struggle there. Um, and so then in 2009, we get Kairos Palestine that comes out, which calls for BDS as a nonviolent tool for change. And it's, we all, do we all know? 
we all know Cairo's document. I don't, because we all say we're all, we see each other all the time. I don't want to talk about stuff we already know about. But so yes, we're all familiar with. There are documents back here. If you want one. Okay, fabulous. So the Cairo's Palestine document comes out, um, and the Presbyterian Church adopts that, and they take it for study. Um, and then in 2010, they decide that they're going to really start looking at this. Um, oh, I apologize. I'm going to jump back to 2004 really quick. IPMN, the Israel-Palestine Mission Network, they came alive during the 2004 when the MRTI process started as well. Um, and so during all of this, the Israel-Palestine Mission Network was doing documents like um, Zionism Unsettled, which they just did recently, but also Steadfast Hope. Um, they've been doing a lot of work in advocacy, really trying to get the information out to presbyteries across the country, um, and then taking it down to individual churches. Can I just ask about the IPMN? Yeah. Did mm -hmm. they, did, a, did an assembly um, constitute IPMN? How did that get started? It did. Yeah, they're actually the only, from what I've been told, they're the only mission network of the Presbyterian Church that was created out of a general assembly. Okay. Which year? 2004. Okay. And I'm going to say, I feel like a lot of what happened in 2004, I'm going to give credit to Rick, to Rick Uffer-Chase. Um, he was probably one of the most progressive people to be elected as moderator, and he did a lot of amazing work when he was there for his term. Um, and he's done a lot of amazing work since, since then. He did a lot of work with the border. He had border links down in Arizona, so he did a lot of that as well. Really brought social witness and advocacy, um, I think, back to the forefront of the denomination. Um, was he lay or? He's lay. Yeah, the moderator, yeah, he was lay. He, he has a fun story. He went to seminary um, to be, do MDiv. He has a similar story to, as I do. And then realized that he wasn't called to ministry and he was called to activism and working on like grassroots work um, within the church. So super amazing guy. He now runs uh, the Stony Point Center out in New York and they do a lot of great work. He works with um, Fellowship of Reconciliation and just an amazing group of people. Amazing, amazing group of people I've met along this journey with, with the church. So 2000, again, 2010, they adopted Kairos. They also, or they approved Kairos for study, um, but they weren't ready to adopt it yet because of its call for BDS. Um, but they also approved for study Breaking Down the Walls, which was another document um, which basically called, said that Israel's occupation of the West Bank and Gaza is a sin against God and other fellow human beings. Were you going to ask a question? Well, Kairos endorsed the BDS. Did they were only endorsing it in the West Bank, or were they endorsing it the, along with the, the way Palestinian society endorsed it? So the PCUSA did not endorse. No, Kairos. The Kairos, the Kairos document is. Oh, it's just right. Yeah. So the the BDS that goes in line with like the National BDS movement. So it included the state, the, the state of Israel proper also. No. I don't, think it, I don't think it does. This is actually a debate. I don't know. Maybe we want to talk about that because I feel like we've talked about it a lot in different settings. Is, is the BDS movement, the 2005 BDS movement that came out, is that a call for a blanket boy the, BDS of Israel or only? No, the Palestinian Civil Society BDS is the entire you know, Israel and the occupied territories and the settlements. Products or? Yeah, I think so. So this. So, of everything or only things that are profiting from elite, from non-peaceful pursuits? Well, Omar Bogudi said, I heard, I was in, in, in Ramallah. Yeah. He said, Ilan Pape and a Palestinian scholar co-wrote a book on Peru, on mm -hmm. the history of Peru. BDS movement would, would object to it. It would, a, it would be a violation of the movement because it would indicate, it would imply that there was equality between the Palestinian society, between the Palestinian scholar, and even the Palestinian, no matter how great the Palestinian is, it's still Israel. That's what, that's what they were saying. So they're, they want to boycott the entire, yeah, I'm, I'm almost, I'm 99.9% sure it's the state of Israel plus so. Interesting. And in the Cairo document, it's not that specific. They right. just talk about right. generally the right. boycott. But I, I'm going to have to read the, the 2005 call because I didn't feel that it was like you would boycott Elon Pape because well, that's he's Israeli. That's not the document. But that's what he said. After he said that, it seems like they got a little looser. Hmm. But they still had the anti-normalization campaign going on. Okay. 
Hmm. So, Kelly? Yeah. The uh, Kairos document says, uh, therefore, we call for a response to what the uh, civil and religious institutions have proposed. As mentioned earlier, the beginning of a system of economic sanctions and boycott to be applied against Israel. Uh, we repeat once again that this is not revenge, but rather a serious action in order to reach a just and definite peace. Um, and then earlier it says, um, Palestinian civil organizations, as well as international organizations, NGOs, and certain religious institutions call on individuals, companies, and states to engage in divestment and in an economic and commercial boycott of everything produced by the occupation. See, this language is key. Well, then why, what about every time like Stevie Wonder, Stephen Hawking? That's a part of the economic, that's a different, there's, there's a couple of different branches of like the BDS campaign at large, because there's the, the academic and educational boycott and cultural boycott, which is like not having artists, like musicians go and play in Israel, not having US scholars go and teach at Israeli universities. Um, I'm still pretty sure that they want to boycott all of this. Because like, would you, are they wanting, even if it's an Israeli company that's not, that's not profiting from the occupation, right. that, um, well, what if it's like, I'm pretty sure that's what they need to do. What if it's a good nonprofit organization that's like working with homeless in Tel Aviv? That I don't know. Yeah. When I heard um, Omar Barghouti one time, yeah. um, he, what he seemed to indicate was you look at whether it's the government of Israel that is sponsoring this thing. So, for example, a university which has ties to the government, what you would, you know, that, that would be boycottable. Um, but like an individual, it doesn't prevent an individual from doing something if an individual is not uh, presenting him or herself as a representative of Israel or of like an Israeli right, organization, right, right. like a connected to the government. I think this is something that's like really worth study for all of us because I think it's an issue that we're seeing where there, I think there's confusion. I think in a lot of people within kind of the activist community. And there's argument there about it because yeah. Amira Haas came and spoke to us right after he did and she took issue with some of the stuff that he had already told us. Yeah, so there's, I mean, there's disagreement but also, there. And also this was just passed in the anti boycott law. You can't. You can you can't advocate boycotting anything. I think within Israel they were talking about. Yeah, That's what yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's, mm -hmm. a, it's it's a response or reaction. Mm -hmm. to the mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, so with the whole within the Presbyterian context, they did not adopt um, Cairo's Palestine or like approve Cairo's Palestine. They approved it for study, but the reason why they were unwilling to adopt it was because they were not ready to make because it. This blanket, I guess. There's this concern of is this a blanket BDS of all of Israel or not? Like, where is this? I think I think the denomination was not sure where this was going, um, and they weren't ready to touch it. Um, but they were ready to study it, you know. And during all of this as well, um, the denomination was sending. They were sending delegations. So 2004 was when the process started. My first trip was in 2007. The church did a big, like the denomination did a peacemaking trip, I know, in 2006, um, where Jeff Dio, who is now the moderator of the Israel-Palestine Net Mission Network, who's also a pastor that I worked under in Florida, he went in 2006. I went in 2007 with the Presbyterian Peace Fellowship, so then they started doing their own trips. Um, and then it just kind of continued, started churches, smaller churches, started doing their own trips. So the denomination as a whole really started engaging in study of the issue kind of on a broader scale. Um, they approved or they approved the study of Kairos, they approved the study of breaking down the walls. So you could tell that they were interested in engaging and they wanted to gain deeper understanding, but they still just weren't ready to make that final step. Um, so once it, and then MRTI brings another report and then their report they recommend denouncing. Oh, sorry, sorry. There we are. Um, so MRTI brings another report to the 2010 <coughs> General Assembly 
where they call for it to denounce Caterpillar. So this is an unprecedented step um, within the nomination. They haven't made a statement like that before, so they're recognizing through the MRTI process and through the study that yes, something needs to be done, and we need to we need to speak out against what we're we're noticing. Um, so they called to denounce Caterpillar. Um, they hadn't taken any steps yet on HP and Motorola. However, they were included in their study, um, and they were included in their engagements. They were so they were communicating with HP and Caterpillar. Um, they just hadn't at this time. They hadn't made a decision on kind of what steps they're going to take next with that. All right, so then this is kind of when I went in 2011 for my two months. I was kind of in between this and then in 2012, I was supposed to go to General Assembly, but then I was in Palestine for six months, so I wasn't able to. Um, and so this is, this is like the big year. 2012, is, I would say, was the tipping point. Um, we've been studying all these documents. Um, the denomination at large across the country has been studying these documents. There have been trips that have been um, being taken place. And so then in 2012, MRTI brings recommendations to divest from the three companies, um, HP, Caterpillar, and Motorola. The opposition resubmitted, and every year they've been, you know, oppositions have been resubmitting overtures calling for the invest or that what we're saying is anti-Semitic or all that fun stuff that we all have to deal with. Um, so once again, opposition resubmitted overtures calling for investment and not divestment. Um, in committee, the divestment overture passes 36 to 11, and the committee decided to combine the strategies. Yes, committee divestment, yes. And the committees decided to combine the strategies, so making it a both and. So now it's not just invest, now it's both. Um, they saw investment as a positive way of helping people under occupation and divestment as an institutional way of making change towards ending the occupation. The committee recognized that investment alone was not going to end the occupation. Still, some Palestinians, as in black townships in South Africa, were saying, do not invest in our prisons. Um, so then in plenary, um, so now the overtures have come out of the committee. Do we have kind of, how many of us attend, have ever attended like national church gatherings? Or even synod gatherings like we just had? I have a feeling that a lot of them function the same way. I might be incorrect in this, but Presbyterian Church is super committee focused, maybe to a fault sometimes. Um, we break it down so small. Um, and so our General Assembly is just like that too. Everything gets broken up into committees. So you have like your Middle East committee, <coughs> and then you have like, um, then you have the committee that was discussing same sex marriage. So you break up all these committees, all of the resolutions that are on those topics go to those committees. They discuss it, then they bring it to plenary. No? Ours doesn't necessarily operate that way. Oh, really? Okay. If, if there's a study authorized, then mm -hmm. there is a committee, of, a task force appointed to do that study. But otherwise, there aren't particular committees on issues. How did your resolution, how did the resolution pass? Oh, just now? Yeah. Well, in our specs at the Senate level. That's okay. The national level. But so from like now, with that, with that resolution, what happens next? So that resolution came out of a group that Joanne and I are part of, which is called Peace Not Wealth. Mm -hmm. We're just um, sort of an ad hoc committee. We formed ourselves. It Does. Was a national um, Peace Not Wealth uh, uh, campaign. Okay. You know, but it is not. It isn't really a group. I mean, you know, it's, hmm. it's individuals who are interested in this. There's no appointed committee or anything like that. When you go to your national assembly. How does the resolution get taken to the National Assembly or does well, it? Well, individual synods will pass memorials a year from now. Okay. There, there will be memorials introduced into several synods and the memorials will have language that's similar enough that they can be combined into um, one memorial to take to the assembly for the whole group to vote on. Interesting. But it's really, it's, it's not, we don't have the committees like that. Interesting. Okay. Well, so then this is going to be, I think, really where you can kind of um, see what the, the Presbyterian Church has done and then how you can maybe take those same tools. Um, because, so yeah, we are all committees. 
Um, lay people are the ones that govern the Presbyterian Church. We don't have any hierarchy. So everything is voted on by like the lay and teaching elders. And yeah, so um, you have the committees and all of the resolutions or overtures as we call them go to these different committees. They discuss them. Sometimes there's minority reports that get presented and then they vote on them. And then whichever get approved, they then go to plenary for the whole denomination to vote on. Ours go sort of directly to Pearl plenary. Okay. Unless it's a task force that's been authorized at a previous assembly. Okay, okay. Cool. Interesting. And they're always short term things. Interesting. No oh, church polity, so. Kelly, yeah, remind them that Presbyterians are in decent and in order. <laughs> that is very true. Presbyterians are known for being decent and in order. Yeah, again, almost to its fault sometimes that it's just. Kelly, yeah, does your clergy have anything? Um, so clergy or teaching elders, or yeah, so I'm a ruling elder. Um, I was elected by my denomination to serve on session. So I am considered an elder, I can vote. Um, I, and only elders, ruling elders and teaching elders are the only ones that can vote at General Assembly. Is it about 50-50? Yes. yes. That's not what ours is. Yeah, it's yeah. And you have to like get approved by your presbytery. So there's like an application process to be a commissioner. Um, and then the presbytery approves you. And then the denomination assigns you to a committee. And so then when you're at general assembly, you attend those committee meetings. And so like you might only be there to only talk about same sex marriage and various issues that come to that committee. Um, and then that gets brought back to plenary it's discussed at plenary. Um, people have an opportunity to come up and you know talk in favor or against, and then people can call the call the table, you know, call the vote or whatever, and then everyone votes. Um, so that's how it works in the Presbyterian Church. Um, and so all of these. So this time in 2012, we're in committee, and the divestment overture passes in committee. Um, and this gets a little messy, and because I wasn't there, I don't fully know, but this is what I've understood has happened. So it, divestment passed in committee. They decided to combine the two um, and then take that report to plenary. But what ended up happening was that the committee chair, instead of presenting it as one overture, he still presented them as two separate overtures and presented the in the invest overture first well so then a minority report and this is where i'm a little fuzzy a minority report came before plenary um, which called to replace divestment language entirely and to replace the mrti report with this investment so the mrti report actually never made it to plenary um, and then this was the vote that passed four by divestment, 333 to 331. So by two votes. So if you would have been able to vote on that resolution? It, well, perhaps. It depends on in what capacity I was there. If I was there as a commissioner, yes. If I was there as just like a dub, like an advocate, then no. And, and, and was the invest, is that sort of best in the Palestinian economy? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, of course. What does MRTI say? Mission responsibility through investment. So it's a committee that um, specifically focuses on corporate engagement. So figuring out what the different, you know, the different companies that the two different investment company firms within the Presbyterian Church. So there's the Presbyterian Foundation, and then another one that I don't remember the name of, um, the pension, I think, like the pension program through the PCUSA. Um, and so it's who they invest that money into, so they look into that, and if there are any companies that are profiting from unpeaceful pursuits, then they start engaging with those companies. Um, and so that is the whole purpose of MRTI. What's the Responsibility. And Kelly, do that is in Palestine or in Israel or in both? This, for this minority report, it was in Palestine. Invest in Palestine. 
Um, and so, and I was there, so I was in Palestine when this passed, which was, which was really interesting because I'm seeing all this like feedback from like IPMN people that are super disappointed. Um, and maybe I'm just an optimist, but I'm like, dude, two votes, we only lost by two votes. Like that's actually pretty good. Um, that's pretty amazing that we only lost by two votes. Um, but people in Palestine, people in Bethlehem were psyched about it. They were just really excited that it got to that point and that the vote was so close. But the conversations that I was having with people were that like, but what are you gonna invest in? How is it gonna get here? You know, because Israel controls imports and all of that. So like, how are you gonna invest? Was kind of the question that I kept hearing on the ground. Um, but so then what's also interesting is that same year, a boycott overture passed by 71%. And this boycott was calling for a boycott of all settlement products. So you can see that like the temperature of General Assembly was definitely on the side of the Palestinians. I mean, Erica, um, Erica Wolf, Becca Wolf, do we know who Becca? She was there, I think she was, was she pregnant? I think she was pregnant at that time. So like everyone was all talking about that and JVP had a huge presence um, that year. And because it was so close, organizations like IPMN and the Presbyterian Peace Fellowship really started pushing for more study and more like come and see trips. And it was also at this time where Zionism Unsettled started being produced. And then the PPF reached out to me to start planning trips for young adults because um, somebody gave a very large donation to the Presbyterian Peace Fellowship for the purpose of bringing young adults to Palestine to learn about it and then have them go to General Assembly. Um, and so I was supposed to be at General Assembly last year, but then I got the job at the hotel and it was like summer and we were short staffed and I couldn't leave. And I was like super disappointed. Would you um, have voted? No, I would have just gone as, Sir, as an advocate. Are they, is there a way you could go to vote or are there forces that are supportive of who would help? No, no I'll support. have to apply. So I'll have to apply to the Presbytery to serve as a commissioner. And then the Presbytery would have to uh, like approve me to be one of their commissioners. And that way, then I would be able to vote. Are your commissioners proportionally representative of the population of Presbyterians? Mm -hmm. So like this uh, local... The Presbytery? Would have so many commissioners. Yes. Number yeah. And it's half clergy, half lay. Yeah, and it's half clergy, half lay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you tell you, yeah. half clergy and half lay, well, there's must be far more lay people than clergy, right? Correct. Okay, so the clergy are given the kind of the greater influence. Yes. Proportionally. Like the Senate or something. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, um, yeah and so the boycott overture was actually written by Jeff Dio, who is the moderator of IPMN. Um, and so that's awesome that that passed you know, 71%. Um, so the minority report that passed um, directed the Presbyterian Foundation to explore investment opportunities in Palestine. The foundation had identified three areas. Um, so micro lending through Palestinian banks, solar panels in the West Bank, and then the DR um, El Nadwa with Mitri Rahib in Bethlehem. Um, a lot of people were saying though, like investment can, can help with bread on the table, but BDS is going to be the only thing that's going to end the occupation. Um, so prior to 2014, the Peace USA had already passed um, boycott and sanctions. Um, and this sanction actually is very similar to the resolution that you guys just passed. Um, let me... It called for military aid to Israel to be tied to Israel's compliance with U.S. laws on human rights. Um, so that happened, that actually passed in 2010. Um, and then that overture also was the basis of the letter for 15, a 15 pack clergy um, that was signed in 2012, which then caused a lot of kind of issues with interfaith dialogue groups and people started getting hot and bothered. 
So that was kind of the process leading up to last summer. Um, and so then last summer, just again, I, I mean, it's the same exact process. Um, but by this time, the MRTI report had finalized um, that there's, there's really no turning back with Caterpillar, HP, and Motorola. They've tried engaging, um, and it's very clear that they have no desire to change their policies. And so then that was what came to the General Assembly, and that was what passed. Um, so now I'm going to kind of talk a little bit about um, how MRTI works. No, I just it kind of lends into the conversation <coughs> the other day. You know, mm -hmm. because, you know, when we were talking about someone else, like how how did that process do? Uh, attempts to talk to their board. Yeah. To talk to their. Yep, that's exactly. That yep, that's okay. exactly what this is. Okay. Um, so I'll just give you a little background about MRTI. Um, it was established in 1970 um, from an overture that went to the General Assembly. It was part of a movement to divest church funds from businesses operating in apartheid South Africa. Um, and the Presbyterian Church was on the forefront of that movement um, and is, is very proud of its involvement in ending apartheid in South Africa. Um, MRTI also helped found an organization called the Interfaith Center for Corporate Responsibility, um, which is the same concept, so um, responsible corporate engagement. Um, so the PCUSA is unique in faith-based investment because of MRTI. Um, no other church groups have committees doing corporate engagement for social justice that includes representatives from the two investing agencies. So that's the Presbyterian Foundation and the Board of Pensions. Um, the four votes on MRTI that represent the foundation and the Board of Pensions make the Presbyterians unique. And in other words, they're the only ones who make these do not invest recommendations with the money people at the table. So this is kind of a breakdown of um, all the different members of MRTI. And these, we have like the Advocacy <coughs> Committee for Women and Concerns and Advocacy, Advocacy Committee for Racial Ethnic Concerns. These are all just different committees <laughs> within the Presbyterian Church, different um, agencies within the PCOSA. Who determines what the makeup of MRTI would be and who participates, which of these groups participate? Is that a, a, a decision at the assembly too? Or? You know, I don't, I don't believe that it is. Um, that's actually, I'm not positive. So maybe then I'm on that. About that. I could, I could, I mean, I could definitely ask that question. I could ask. So I know the woman who served as the uh, advocacy chair for the, or the racial and ethnic concerns. Um, she is an elder, just like I am, within a church. And so I think that she, just through her other kind of elder work within the denomination, got elected to serve in that role. Oh, so they were elected? We're all, yeah, everybody. Yeah, and we're all in serve terms. Um, so I think they're two-year terms. On the MRTI. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. Well, and on the other committees as well. So it's constantly, we're constantly rotating out leadership. Um, so, all right, so these are the tools. These are the things that, this is the process that MRTI um, went through. So they moved, so there's research and consul cons consultations with Presbyterians and ecumenical partners. So really trying to gain support from other people, other um, investors, other churches, and then they start communicating with these companies. Um, so sending letter to boards of directors, similar to what we've been doing, Carla, with Noble Energy, so wanting to send the letters directly to the people involved, you know, letting them know why, we, why we're challenging them, what they're doing, um, you know, bringing up, like with Noble Energy in a letter that I wrote, what I was saying is, you know, in your mission you talk about responsible corporate engagement, but yet you're behaving in ways that are actually contradictory to what you're saying. And so that was a lot of what that correspondence was about. Then they started scheduling meetings with management, filing shareholder resolutions, proxy voting, soliciting supports from other shareholders, participating in public appeals, and then finally, divestment is the final. Excuse me, could you 
So from what I have heard, they were. Um, they were willing to meet with them. Now whether or what they were actually willing to talk about what they were there to talk about, sounds like they had a lot more trouble. Um, and so again, I wasn't directly involved in these meetings. Um, I've been involved in this in kind of much more of, of the advocacy role. I've helped lead trips to the region. Um, I've sat on like smaller committees with the Presbyterian Peace Fellowship. Um, and I've done various little pieces kind of in the bigger, you know, I have just a little bit of the puzzle I've been involved in, just a tiny piece of it. Yeah. Yeah, Ken, yeah I mean, I would assume the Presbyterian Church is a significant investor in all these yeah. uh, companies. The companies would yeah. want to keep them calm. It's kind of like the Senators and Congressmen they both keep with us. Right. Well, one would think, one would think, I mean, they met with them, but um, from what I've heard Nusheen say is sometimes um, they show up to the meetings and it wouldn't be the people that they had actually scheduled the meetings with. It would be like their aides and they wouldn't have been like informed about what the topic was. And so like people from MRTI were leaving these meetings feeling really insulted. Like you don't even, you don't care. You obviously do not care. Um, and it was, they had hope, you know? I mean, it took them, um, it, it's, it's taken 10 years to get to this point. They tried to continue to have these meetings. Um, and it just, they weren't willing to budge, you know? Um, so MRTI is engaged and continues to engage with corporations, um, though not all at the same time or with equal intensity. Um, and summaries are included in the MRTI report, which if you're interested in receiving, I have a card um, on the table, or if you already have my email address, just shoot me an email and I'll send it to you. I had thought about printing them, but I didn't want to waste the paper, and I thought you guys would probably just on your computers. <laughs> um, and so some of them were successful or ended with corporate restructuring. So some of the companies that MRTI has worked with in the past, this process did work. Um, but it's important to note that while MRTI has been engaging with companies listed on the screen, um, there are also many companies that are doing business in Israel that MRTI um, or the, the PCUSA has holdings in, but they're not engaging. Um, and so that's like Coca-Cola, Procter & Gamble, IBM, McDonald's. Um, and the reason why they say this is these companies are not profiting from unpeaceful pursuits. That, that's like their key word is profiting from unpeaceful pursuits. Um, so like McDonald's just has franchises all throughout Israel. It's not, but I don't <laughs> Right, or you know, I think, are there any McDonald's? In, are there McDonald's in settlements? Yeah. See, so maybe that might be something that, you know, the another another step. You know, I mean, this is this process isn't perfect. Well, it's, just um, a big, it's just a big thing to see when they want to start a boycott and don't call it not. Yeah. Well, and, you know, and I'm sure that IPM and PPF, as soon as more companies start getting put on the BDS list, they're going to jump on board and we're going to keep pushing the larger denomination to add those to the list. Um, Kelly, do we know who did research and restructure? I don't. That would be. That would be, yeah. Well, I think like Taco Bell is one of them because you know there's the Immokalee workers um, a few, you know, 15 years ago or so with the call from the Immokalee workers about tomatoes. Um, and they were calling on like Yum Brand Foods um, to, to focus on restructuring so that the Immokalee workers were getting paid more. Um, and I think that there was, that's probably an area because I know that the church was involved in that. I remember there being, it was actually one of the things that brought me to the Presbyterian Church was hearing about the, boy, the Taco Bell boycott and how the denomination was taking the stand for the Immokalee workers. And I was like, you know what? It kind of lines up with my theology. I like those guys. I'm gonna go hang out with them for a little bit. Um, so, so possibly, possibly like Young Brain Foods. Um, well, and so over these 10 years, the MRTI report, through all of their conversations, through their shareholder meetings and everything, and obviously the companies not engaging um, not deciding to change their policies. So the MRTI report was presented at General Assembly last year, which called for divestment from these three companies. 
And so now, I know a lot of us probably know stuff about what's going on with Caterpillar, but this is still um, some information that you can take back to your churches or <coughs> groups or anybody else that you work with if you want to continue to push these companies. Um, and so we know Caterpillar has produced, sold, and profited from equipment that has been and continues to be used clearly for non-peaceful purposes by the Israeli military. Other government agencies and private companies under con and other government agencies and private companies under contract with the Israeli government. Um, this includes the demolition of homes of Palestinian civilians, the destruction of Palestinian agricultural land, including the uprooting of generation-old olive trees, vital to the economic livelihood of the people, and the building of settlements, segregation roads, the construction of the apartheid wall, and just kind of everything that Israel is doing. They are using these caterpillar tractors, bulldozers, everything for it. Um, this is actually really, I, this is really interesting. Um, so engagement with Caterpillar by MRTI and its ecumenical partners has been going on for quite a while, but it's not been making progress um, beyond clarifying a few of the issues. So unlike some other companies, Caterpillar continues to take no responsibility for the end use of their products or the actions of its Israeli dealerships. So basically, once it's out of their hands, they don't care. Um, and so as we can see, this is, this, this is the product that's being sold. You know what I mean? They're weaponized. And oftentimes Israel is weaponizing them when they get there. Um, so it gets sold to the military and then the military weaponizes them. Um, sometimes Caterpillar ships them like this? Or are you not sure? I'm not positive. Okay. But I think that they definitely ship like, more, they have more intense ones than just like the cat you see down the street that's like working on like, you know, the VA hospital down in Colfax. Um, so what, what, what I heard from Nusheen um, is, so they started correspondence in 2003. They had four conversations over the years. They filed shareholder resolutions. And in 2010, you can just see all of the votes were over 20%. And what I've heard is that in order for you to be able to resubmit a resolution for the following year, you have to get over like seven or 10%. So you can see that people within like the Caterpillar shareholders, like they're recognizing what's going on. They're recognizing what Caterpillar is doing, but yet Caterpillar is still refusing to make any changes. Um, and so MRTI believes that this means that there are large institutional investors that are voting with us at the Caterpillar meetings. Um, and this became really apparent in 2012 when Caterpillar was taken off the Morgan Stanley Capital Index because of its status and because of like the bad press that it was getting. And in December of 2007, Caterpillar sent a letter to its faith-based investors stating that as an industry leader, Caterpillar advocates responsible use of its equipment. But don't blame us if someone uses it. Right? We expect our customer you to, customers to use the products they purchase from us in environmentally responsible ways. Sounds good. <laughs> right? Sounds wonderful. Um, and Caterpillar does have a worldwide code of conduct, conduct, and it states that it expects its customers, which the company narrowly defines to mean only its dealers, to use their products in environmentally responsible ways. So only its dealers. So not who its dealers maybe are selling things to. So Caterpillar has a product, sells a product to an Israeli dealer. Then that Israeli dealer is contracted by the Israeli military. Caterpillar's hands are clean. They had nothing to do with it. They need a sticker that says, this product shall not be used to kill children. Right? <laughs> or demolish our homes. Right. They need a little apologies. Now, if you keep doing genocide, we're not going to sell this. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so then the letter went on to say that Caterpillar expects their company uh, to be consistent with regards to human rights and the requirements of international humanitarian law. Sounds beautiful, doesn't it? It sounds like a really great code of conduct, but there's no implementation, obviously. Um, so, but the company has no process for making it 
exceptions operational and has stated in the dialogue with us that it has no intention of developing a process. So it's really there just for show. Um, so I wonder if Noble Energies is there just for show too. Well, Kelly, have they ever checked out who the board of directors are of Caterpillar? I mean, are they even shell titles? You know, I don't know. I'm, I'm sure they probably have, but who knows? Who knows? Um, and so for several years, Caterpillar has stated that its equipment is only sold to the Israeli military through U.S. government programs that include regulations to ensure the protection of innocent civilians. But in a dialogue that MRTI had with Caterpillar in 2008, the company admitted that its Israeli dealer does sell equipment to the Israeli military. Um, so this would be military money that we pay? Yes. Right. It's your tax dollar. Yeah. You're paying for it. Yeah. No, wait, it's not really, what it is is the U.S. gives us a little money that Israel has to spend 76% of the money on American defense products. So that's from American manufacturing. But like the U.S. government programs, we're funding those U.S. government programs. Our tax dollars are funding the government programs that are giving money to Israel for Israel to then turn back around and give us the money back <laughs> to buy the products. I just can't help but laugh. Like, I just can't skip that stuff, you know, yeah. you could just give it directly. And like, it just, I don't know, just the ridiculousness of it. Um, I find humorous. Um, all right. This one blows my mind too. Um, so the IDF Caterpillar dealer relationship has actually been going on for a long time. And um, Haaretz reported in 2009 that the IDF was planning to draft the civilian employees of the Israeli dealer, Caterpillar dealer, so that repairs and maintenance can be carried out right on the battlefield in the context of military rather than civilian service. So basically, IDF recruiters walk into Israeli Caterpillar dealership and list them in the IDF so that they can go and service Caterpillar machinery out on the battlefield. Huh. They should refer to one of the letters from Caterpillar and say, I'm not allowed to do that. Right? Right? So in 2010, Caterpillar changed its position that it could not instruct its subsidiaries regarding their sales decisions by telling all of its international subsidiaries not to sell any equipment to customers in Iran or customers in other countries that would then transfer the equipment to Iran. But not in Double standard. Read that again. All right, so in 2010, Caterpillar changed its position that it could not instruct its subsidiaries regarding their sales decisions by telling all of its international subsidiaries not to sell any equipment to customers in Iran or customers in other countries that would then transfer equipment to Iran. That was actually probably part of the Iran sanctions of the US. They probably have, were forced to do that by the government. Possibly. As part of the sanctions. Hmm. Well, I don't know when these sanctions went into effect. Yeah. That sounds like it. It's still, still a little double standard. Yeah. Still just, just. Yeah. We can sell this to Iran, but I can't sell Right, right. Um, and so then MRTI kind of wants it to be clear that they're not comparing Israel to Iran, but I think we all understand what this is saying. Um, so, but the way that Caterpillar explained it to MRTI, because MRTI did say like, double standard much, guys. And um, they're like, this is a business decision. So just didn't care to have the conversation. What about the responsibility clause in your statement? All right. So sadly, despite significant support for the shareholder resolutions on human rights policies, Caterpillar has become even more intringent. Caterpillar continues to accept no responsibility for the end use of their products. And MRTI notes that over many years, the company has not indicated a willingness to review 
let alone change its policies for distribution or sales in conflicted areas like Israel and Palestine, and does not acknowledge a responsibility for its dealers' adherence to human rights policies in these areas. After nearly a decade of corporate engagement, Israel, MRTI concluded that further efforts to engage Caterpillar will not be successful. So this was a result. This is what was um, presented in their report that was presented at GA. All right, Hewitt Packard, HP. So HP is a diversified company that supplies the Israeli military with communication and computer hardware equipment and customized software solutions. These have been used in particular by the Israeli Navy during the blockade on Gaza. And additionally, through its subsidiaries, EDS, HP, profits from biometric scanners used in the checkpoints. They are machines that scan handprints. The use of these scanners to which Palestinians, but not Israelis or foreign tourists, must submit have been called dehumanizing and discriminatory. The company has also contracted with these legal Israeli settlements in the West Bank, providing employment and business services to these um, illegal settlers. Does anyone, have we seen the biometric scanners? Has anyone seen them? Yeah, yeah. MITI leadership, MRTI leadership has participated in the dialogue, um, dialogues that you can see here noted on the screen, um, as well as they had another meeting back in January of 2013. Um, I'm sure they met again um, in 2014, though I don't have information as a result. Because I'm not privy to all that information because I'm not a part of those committees. Um, but MRTI has a deep disappointment in its, that in spite of agreed upon agendas and topics with questions sent in ahead of time, the people the company placed on the 2011 call were unprepared and said they were not familiar with the concerns we were expressing. Um, that is the bioscanners. And even though these had been the main subject of our prior conversations, and in fact are the top items to come up in a simple Google search of HP. Um, so even when they were meeting with the people, the people were coming saying, we have no idea what you're talking about. I just get blown away by the craziness of this whole thing. Um, so they filed a shareholder resolution in 2013 um, calling for a review of their human rights policy. Um, and then in January 2013, Dialogue focused on HP marketing brochure for work with illegal settlements. Um, and HP declines to discuss any business with the Israeli government or, is, or illegal settlements. So Ariel, one of Israel's biggest settlements, was started in 1978 by the Israeli government and poses a serious impediment to creating a viable Palestinian state, kind of right there in the middle. Um, MRTI learned that HP worked with the government of the settlement of Ariel in the occupied West Bank to develop specialized, specialized solutions for government data storage and used this product in marketing publicity. So despite the fact that REL is deep within the West Bank, the company's sales brochures claim that REL is right in the middle of Israel and also right in the heart of Israel. They include the use of a map and a sales brochure making no reference to the West Bank as a separate occupied territory. So this is the map. The top one is the map that they use in their, in their brochure. HP told MRTI that they are not a political entity and do not make political statements. And MRTI told them that this map is in fact a political statement. Very And in its Global Citizen Reports for 2010 and 2012, HP stated its commitment to human rights and cited its involvement in several human rights initiatives. However, nowhere did HP discuss the relationship of its policy commitments to its involvement in non-peaceful pursuits in Israel and Palestine. The annual meeting was held on March 20th, 2013, and the resolution on reviewing the human rights policy received 7.32% um, sufficient to refile the resolution for the following year. 
However, when it was refiled for the 2014 annual meeting, the company opted to challenge the resolution at the uh, SEC instead of changing their policies. At the SEC, the challenge? That's what I was told. And so although HP has been open to meet with religious shareholders on an annual basis, the discussions have been very disappointing for MRTI. Contrary to its stated commitment to transparency, the company now declines to discuss its involvement in specific non-peaceful pursuits. It has even addressed the issue of how its human rights policies, about which the company is very proud, informed its decisions about its business with governments, especially governments involved in serious human rights violations. This negates their so-called gold standard human rights policy. Furthermore, while required by law to, part to practice equal employment opportunities in the United States and in Israel, HB collects no data in Israel to measure this performance, except perhaps, perhaps by gen for gender. And Israeli technology companies have a very deficient track record for hiring minorities. And while non-Jews comprise 20% of the Israeli population, according to HP itself, the industry employment is less than 1% non-Jewish. And so without a major change in HP's willingness to engage in serious discussions, MRTI believes that corporate engagement is not likely to achieve positive results. Regretfully, MRTI has concluded that there is no indication at present that MRTI will change its course. Can I ask a question? Um, I'm assuming all these discussions are to deal with the um, corporation and through the stocks, not individuals buying HP products. Or like in Fort Collins, we have a lot of HP, big HP employee players. And, yeah. Um, you know, I'd like to tell them not to work there, but. Yeah. <laughs> well, so is it always dealing with shareholders pretty much? Well, yeah. so like divestment uh -huh. is specifically dealing with like the company and shareholders. But there is also a call for boycott of HP, okay. which is HP products so as well. Both. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, and that's why the BDS campaign is is so broad, it's, it's three tactics, you know? So there's the boycott, which is let's hurt HP by letting people know what HP is involved in and let's stop buying HP, HP products. So let, let's hurt HP that way. But then there's also the divestment part where let's stop investing in HP as a company because that's gonna hurt them as well. So there are two different tactics, two different approaches. Does anything happen? Does anybody sanction? I mean, is there any sanctions going on? I guess that's the in governments the same. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, so they, the PCUSA approved that resolution in 2010 about military aid being tied to Israeli compliance with like US laws on human rights. Um, I'm not sure about other. Sanction is, you know, that's the one people talk about. There's not a lot happening with sanctions. Um, and I think we need a, that's, that's governments. I think kind of on a bigger scale, yeah. um, really. But who knows? I mean, it might start happening. There are a lot of governments around the world that are that are taking stands and that are speaking up. So, I mean, I don't see the U.S. sanctioning Israel anytime soon. Um, but that doesn't mean that, like Argentina might not or somebody, you know. When making settlement aid, um, I mean, when making the construction of settlements, uh, you know, impediment. Mm -hmm. Making our aid to Israel contingent on they're not um, building settlements. Right. Would that be a sanction? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think. I think so. Because okay. we are not going to financially support your com your country. We're not going to financially support your government okay. unless you do this. And I think that's kind of that's what sanctions is really about is is targeting the government. Um, or is a sanction instructing our corporations, like in Iran, the sanctions involved instructing our corporations not to do business with them. Right. Yeah. So maybe it's broader. I think it's, yeah. Well, I it's, think also, it's also impounding their money. Or yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. 
See, I think that this is just an, this is just a topic that we need to continue to I mean to continue to examine like because there are so many voices and I think it's kind of that across the table within the movement there are so many voices that are contributing um, that I think every organization that's working needs to really have a strong understanding of what BDS at least means to them. Um, you know, so that if we're having bus ads that are being presented to us, we can say, yes, we agree with what this ad is saying, or no, we don't agree with what this ad is saying. Um, because we as groups have said, this is what BDS means to us, this is what we're willing to do, um, or, you know, however, however we see that. Um, playing out. All right, so the third company that MRTI brought before um, General Assembly is Motorola Solutions, um, which is a large electronic and telecommunications company with, with a substantial presence in Israel. Um, in early discussions with Motorola focused primarily on the integrated and encrypted communication system, um, known as Mountain Rose, that the company sold to the Israeli military and the wide area surveillance systems provided to the Israeli settlements that are deemed illegal under international law. All three dialogues the company declined to meet in person um, and provided only partial answers to written questions. Thus, MRTI has relied on shareholder resolutions to seek change at the company, which were supposed to gather, which were supported together with other religious investors. Um, and so you can see I mean, still the proxy, like the votes are still coming in and, you know, being higher than that seven to seven to ten percent that are needed to continue to resubmit those resolutions. Okay. Yeah. So is the Presbyterian Church, there's still investors in these companies. Are they, right? I mean, they haven't, they haven't fully divested, they haven't sold their shares. Um, I'd have to look in more. Someone, I'd have to ask. Are they still more. investors so they can have some input, so they can try to so they can promote these resolutions so other shareholders get to see them? Um, I mean, I think, and again, I'm not, I'm not super, super knowledgeable about like really in, in depth about the process, but I don't think that they're still engaging. I don't think that they are submitting resolutions anymore. I think maybe they're advocating with other churches that still are. Um, you know, investing with these companies and they're working and partnering with other denominations. So and if they're not submitting resolutions anymore, I would think that they would divest the book and all their shares. I can ask. Yeah. I mean, definitely I can find out some more information from people who are, like, sit, who sit on MRTI and who sit on these companies. Yeah. Um, there's, this is one of the things with the, the denomination is it's so large and it's kind of the way that it's divided right. is it's hard to really know everything that's going on. Um, but yeah, I can definitely, I can ask some questions because I know that I know the right people. So yeah, I can definitely find out more. Did you say that there was a certain product that the product is illegal under international law? The settlements are, but did um, you say there was a certain product that they made? No, 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 the surveillance. So they use a product. There's a Motorola, what, what did I just say? Um, so Motorola has developed this surveillance equipment that is used in the settlements. The surveillance, not the equipment, but the surveillance is what's illegal under international law. So like the settlements are survey, like have cameras, you know, looking around because they're all on top of the hills. And so looking around to make sure there aren't any Palestinians coming in and all that stuff. That surveillance, the act of surveillance is what's illegal. And then Motorola is providing the equipment that they are using for the surveillance. And this is why it's like, you'll even hear, I mean, one day, so 2011, I'm living with this family. We go for a drive to Hebron. Um, we come back, it's dark, it's late at night. Um, we end up on the wrong road. And we get really close to a checkpoint and like a, a shepherd kind of was out and stops us and was like, you guys need to turn, turn around or they're going to shoot you. And it was like, a, there's surveillance, and they're going to see you, and because of the different color license plates, they're going to be able to identify you, and you're in danger, turn around and go home. And so that's the surveillance. You know, that was a scary. My drive, like the family I was with was scared. And they didn't even really tell me until after we got home, because it's all happening in Arabic, and I'm like, what's going on? 
like, what's happening here? <laughs> I can tell you're all a little bit nervous and I don't know what's happening. Um, and then on the drive back, they were like, so we were on the wrong road. And I'm like, hmm, all right, <laughs> awesome guys. I trust you, you're my drivers. I trust you guys to not let me get in trouble. All right, and so then in 2011, Motorola splits into two companies. There's Mo and Motorola Solutions and Motorola, Motorola Mobility, which is gonna be your cell phones. Um, Motorola Solutions retained their Israeli subsidiaries and continued to participate in business activities involved in non-peaceful pursuits. So corporate engagement continued with them, but not Motorola Mobility. And at the 2011 annual meeting, the CEO, Greg Brown, announced the company would increase sales efforts in the Middle East. And unfortunately, on December 31st, 2013, Motor Motorola Solutions signed a 15-year communication contract with the Israel Israeli Ministry of Defense to provide the company's next generation of ruggedized smartphones to the IDF and the Ministry of Defense. The contract will cost $100 million, with half provided by the United States military assistance to cover the cost of adaptation, development, and production of the devices for the Israeli military by Motorola Solutions US. The other half of the program will be funded by the Israeli military budget, primarily covering maintenance of the systems over 15 years by Motorola Solutions Israel. And a quote from January 2014 press release, Brigadier General Shamul, I can't pronounce his Hebrew last name, Sukkur, T-Z-U? Yeah. 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 So, Was that close? Yeah, T-Z-U-K-E-R. Sucker, yeah. Okay, I was, it was close. Sucker, head of Israel's <laughs> Ministry of Government um, Procurement, boasted, the new program marks the transition of the smartphone revolution to the battlefield of the future and will provide a significant advantage to the IDF and the entire security apparatus. So it might look like a rugged cell phone, and that's what it looks like down there and being used. So it might look like a rugged cell phone, but Motorola Solutions says it's far more than that. Motorola Solutions involvement remains significant and are now locked in for another 15 years at least. Regrettably, MRTI concluded there is little likelihood the company's position will change through continued corporate engagement. So those are kind of the discoveries that MRTI found during their process, their 10-year process of corporate engagement with these three companies, which is what finally led to the passing of the divestment overture. Um, so I just kind of wonder, because every denomination is different, um, what, can, what do you guys think you can take um, from kind of the PCUSA's process? We do already have corporate social responsibility, and there is like I can't think what it's called, but there's some kind of a committee mm -hmm. that does t that does look at that, and we have passed resolutions that, are, that have asked them to do that. Awesome. And I don't know what the status of that is yet. <laughs> so I mean, I do see how that kind of fits into the picture. Yeah, right here. So that's. Yeah, so I mean, I think the different, so like the Presbyterian Church, the different steps that they've taken have been um, initiating the MRTI process. So the direct corporate engagement with the companies. Um, there is the creation of the Israel-Palestine Mission Network, which focuses, was on advocacy, um, creating these educational documents. And um, then you have groups like the Presbyterian Peace Fellowship, which um, are leading trips and really trying to get the word out within, you know, the denomination. Um, you have groups that are doing the exact same thing, but that believe the opposite of what we do. Um, you know, so those are kind of the steps that the PCUSA has taken. I mean, we partnered with JVP. I heard that by JVP, JVP's presence at the past two general assemblies was really powerful. Um, so I think having that Jewish, that young, it was like young Jewish and proud and, you know, I support divestment, ask me why. Um, you know, having that presence was really challenging people. Because I think when you're approaching the BDS and all of this through churches, people are really concerned about interreligious dialogue. Mm 
that's kind of the biggest concern is like it just stops it. And especially in like a post Holocaust world where there's still a lot of guilt that I think churches feel about not taking a stand and doing anything, you know, during World War II, that I think that there's just a lot of fear. And, you know, so I don't, yeah, and I don't know what, you know, I think what you guys are doing is the same thing as what we had been doing. And didn't the Methodists, uh, didn't they pass resolutions also? They, they have been bringing resolutions yeah. to the table too. I'm not positive what their status is. Yeah. Would it be more powerful if a lot of churches joined your MRPI and did it as a group, uh, as uh, other churches and uh, smaller denominations would join with Well, them? so that's... So the JVP was there, that was really nice, but maybe if the UUs and all of them had been there, it might Yeah, be I mean, you know, personally me, I'm a huge believer in like ecumenical engagement. I think that, you know, getting together and supporting each other I talk with Arnie even about this, not even just within churches, but within our local groups. Yeah. You know, how can we really like, you know, join together and be one big loud voice instead of just like a whole bunch of small voices? Um, but I think, I think it's a process. I think we just really need to get a strong, committed group of people that are willing to take it on. But I mean, like without, outside of MRTI, there is that Interfaith Center for Corporate Responsibility, um, which MRTI was a part of founding. But that is an interfaith group which focuses in corporate engagement. So I think that's more of. Well, I think the churches from Middle East Peace are already set up with a whole. Yeah. You know, yeah. 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 It, yeah. So structure. So it seems like a lot of us just don't know how to go about getting yes. to that. And right. time, I, I hate to see so much time being spent to get organized to do it. So maybe we'll do it two years down the road. And in the meantime, 500,000 kids are killed again. Yeah. But, 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 yeah, yeah, you're right. You're right. You're right. Yeah. I actually think they came on their own. Did they, um, did they part with the U.S. campaign? Mm, maybe. But I think they kind of showed up in 2012. I think they showed up on their own. I think that was that they knew that these overtures were being presented, and they knew that they needed to be there. So they did sort of demonstrations, um, you know. Yes. And, uh, yeah. So yeah. what I heard. Yeah, and as a matter of fact, uh, I was on a conference call a couple of years ago with Adam Walter mm -hmm. and Sydney Levy from JP. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. From US and uh, they were asking people to. Volunteers, so they gave us. Yeah. I was given, and everybody on the poll was given a list of names to call. Yeah, we were voters within. Yep, yep, yep. So to try to gauge, yeah. Yeah, so that was kind of some of the stuff. Um, gosh, oh my goodness, so yeah, many little things. I'm sorry, the information yeah. tables, I think, at GA, which was really helpful. Yes, way. yeah. So there's tabling that happens. Um, I knew there were these signs that like the young Jewish and proud, they had t-shirts that said, I support divestment, ask me why. Um, and they were just kind of a presence. And then during committee, they did test, they testified during committees. So they would go up and speak um, why they supported divestment. Um, but I think in 2012, I truly think that they showed up on their own. Um, or it could have been in relationship with the Presbyterian Peace Fellowship, which I think issued them an award for like the work that they've been doing that year. I think at like the PPF's like breakfast that they hold at GA. I think JVP, it's either this year, it was either last year they issued JVP with an award or the year before that. I don't remember, but I know they have. But yeah, where they were getting, what, they've, what all of these different groups like IPMN and PPF did was they got lists of all of the commissioners and then they distributed it to people from the PPF's trip, people from IPMN, JVP. And so you could see who is in your area and you could like set up a lunch with them or place a phone call and say, hey, I was just on a trip to Israel Palestine with the Presbyterian Peace Fellowship. I see you're a delegate for General Assembly this year. Um, do you have time for me to talk to you about my experience? Um, Mm -hmm. And also the delegates I called were the voters. Yeah. I don't think any of them really 
knew what was going on. Yeah. There. Yeah. Then you had a real understanding of the actual history. Right. Right, it's true. And so that's why, you know, and and I think this might be true for all denominations, I'm not sure, but when you're functioning in a denomination that's so large, just because the General Assembly, like, approves a study doesn't mean that that study is going to make it to every church in the denomination. Um, it might get down to, like, a presbytery level where it gets presented at, like, a presbytery meeting and gets approved for study at a presbytery meeting. But then people still need to bring the study to the church. And if people aren't bringing the study to the church, then people aren't learning about it, you know? And, you know, and that's why they need people kind of like all of us who are gonna be the ones that are gonna go and be like, hey, this really interesting study just came out called Zionism Unsettled. Let's have a study group about it. You know, that's the type of things that need to start happening more in churches. But I think churches are scared. I just still think churches are super, super scared. Another thing I, I think is that people who tend to go to these assemblies and meetings and stuff like that tend to be people who are really interested in the bureaucracy of the church. And yeah. And they're not necessarily interested in what direction the church is going to They're take. interested in the process. Yeah, they're yeah. interested in... Yeah, they're, they're right? kind of, um, they, they like the hierarchy, they like the, yeah. you know, but they, but they aren't interested in particular issues. Right, there are GA junkies. Like, yeah. there are GA junkies that go to GA every year just because they, like, they dig it. I could probably be one of those people. <laughs> like, I admit I like committee meetings. I'm weird. Yeah, I like networking. Yeah. I like going to breakfast. But they don't have a purpose, you know, they're just there. Oh, yeah. Uh, I would like to have a little more discussion about the boycott part. Are there any groups, like if the Presbyterians, are they out there pushing a boycott for a product? Are they carrying signs and saying, don't do, don't buy more? Yeah, yeah. I know don't buy a caterpillar, but I'm not buying more. <laughs> yeah. Don't buy Sabra yeah. Hubbis, for example. Yeah. Yeah. So I, they, do they have an artist? Because I would think I'd like to do some of that, but I don't know how, I don't understand it well enough. Yeah. I'm frightened to do it. Right, so if you go to IPMN, the Israel-Palestine Mission Network, if you just Google Israel-Palestine Mission Network, uh -huh. um, they have like advocacy information and resources. So you can come up with like a list of some products that they recommend. Mm -hmm. um, but then I think a lot of it's really coming down to the personal. Um, you personally not buying Sabra hummus, but then having a conversation with somebody about it. You know, someone at the hotel the other day that I work at, like, just went and got one of those, like, little mini cups of Sabra hummus that they do with, like, the pretzels. And she was like, mm, I just had some Sabra hummus. It was so oh, delicious. She actually said Sabra? Yeah. Well, I think she said I went and got some hummus from the 7-Eleven, and I know that the hummus at the 7-Eleven happens to be the Sabra hummus. You know, like... <laughs> Well, that too. So that was part of it. I was like, well, so first thing, there's listeria. Um, so don't eat sour hummus because you get sick. Um, but, but Kelly, the Code Pink's website has a whole list yeah. of companies to yeah. boycott. And what it means for you, right. if you're fearful of it, is just don't buy those things. Right. What website? You know, Code, code pink, pink. pink. And code is pink. Who yeah. profits? Yeah. Right. Profits. That do BDS or promote yeah. yeah. BDS. And they yeah. not affiliated. Yeah. Right. Yeah. There's so many. Um, I think yes. that. And you can link to them from the Sabeel uh, Colorado homepage. Oh, I'm seeing the list, but I just didn't know what to do next. And, yeah. um, and are they things well, that are made in Israel? Are in their Palestine that they don't want to ship through Israel? How does that work? No, not just. I don't think it's just that. No, no, it's no Ahava, Soda Stream, uh, Tribe and Sarah Hummus. So those are manufactured. Tiva and you're, you're boycotting them because they're manufactured in Israel? Because they're Israel. No. So, 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 well, so there's, so this is, this is where we still need to work, I think, on this conversation yeah. and like what this means. So from a Presbyterian perspective, the Presbyterian Church approved an overture calling for boycott of settlement products. That's what the PCUSA did. That's what their vote was, which is a different boycott than what you might hear elsewhere. So PCUSA 
only voted to boycott products that were made in settlements. So that would be SodaStream, um, and yes, yeah, yeah, Ahava, because the salt, the, the Dead Sea products, things like that. Um, that was what the Presbyterian Church called for. However, there are other boycott calls that are larger than that, that are all Israeli products. So that would include Teva or Teva sandals. Those are an Israeli product. So that would mean boycotting those. So those are Tevas, but are no, yours are Columbia, you're okay. <laughs> but you know, so it's like those things. But then there's also the boycott, the academic cultural boycott. Um, so boycotting Israeli professors that might come and speak in the United States, or you know, not having American professors go and speak in Israel, or boycotting musicians. I mean, we can do it on our side too. Like if we heard that, you know, Fleetwood Mac went and played in Israel, and then Fleetwood Mac was coming to Denver, and you're a huge Fleetwood Mac fan, you could be like, no, I'm not going to give you my money because you just went and you know performed in Israel. So there's a lot of different ways, and I think within the movement at large, do what you can. You know, you're not expected to do everything. Um, every little bit helps. So if you love hummus and you're used to buying Sabra, just change your brand. Um, or if you buy Dead Sea products, just change your brands. And then, but I think the conversation piece is important too. You know, talking to people about, oh, hey, why don't you buy Sabra hummus anymore? Oh, well, this is why. Where would you find a list of the products that are produced in the settlements? In the so if you go to the Israel-Palestine Mission Network, okay. um, go into their resources, you'll yeah, be able to find. Limited, yeah, they'll. I, I, would, I, would, I myself boycott anything produced by Israel because Israel proper is what's making the settlements. Yeah. I mean, it's the government, you know, it's the government, the state of Israel itself that is perpetuating yeah. this. So. And, and Israelis who, there are lots of Israeli groups who are engaging in the boycott themselves, and they, that's what they would say as well. Yeah. Well, J Street says they won't do the boycott because they don't want to hurt Israel. Well, right, and so this is the thing, though. There's so many different voices that are coming to the table on this, and it's... Do, so, yeah, right? So, you know, um, do what you do, do what works for you. Um, right. Do what, what you're feeling called to do. If you, if you feel that boycotting Israel, blanket boycott Israel, everything related to coming out of all of that, then do that and promote that and tell people about that. It's a lot easier to do that. That's pretty straightforward. Yeah. So, I mean, you just have to, you have to do what works best for you. And I think, I think that because this issue has so many different, people approach it from so many different ways. Um, people are invested in it in different manners. Um, it may be stronger I think that, if everybody approached it one way. But I don't know if that's ever going to happen. Yeah. You know, but I agree with you. I agree with you. I just don't know if that's going to happen. Only when the United States decides to feel uh, yeah. like they did South Africa. Yeah, I mean, so. Yeah. And, and we, do, we do have to say that uh, it is working. It is working. The divestment yeah. sanction yeah. boycott the movement is working. It is. Um, when we talk to. Uh, um, having a brain drain. One of the what uh, last year over there, he said that uh, af after uh, about six years in the boy BDS movement against Israel and the occupied territories oh, is yeah. already where it took 20 years to go in South Africa. I mean, so it is, it is speeding up. And uh, so, so it, it's working. And um, yeah, it's just got to be done. Yeah, yeah. And that's why this amendment, the Senate is trying to attach, attach on to the TIPP to to uh, dissuade the European Union countries from from uh, from boycotting Israeli products. It's such a horrible, terrible, you know, destructive yeah. force. I mean, yeah. Try to turn back the BDS success. Well, and then this is where you know something, and I don't know if a lot of people, and we're still working on figuring out more about this, but. Um, Noble Energy, there's, 
talk of a deal that Noble Energy is, is working on with Israel um, for some natural gas fields that are out in the Mediterranean that are actually in disputed waters. So, you know, Lebanon claims that territory belongs to them, Israel claims it belongs to them, and then also down towards Gaza, you know. And so then, and then Jordan is talking about trying to buy natural gas from Israel, which could end up putting like what, 15 million or billion dollars? 15 billion dollars. 15 billion dollars. Which would mean the whole boycott uh, you know, uh, thing has gone to waste, you know, if they get that much more money. Yeah, so you can, Israel, it's, it's the BDS movement is having an impact and you can see that Israel is needing to come up with other ways to be getting money because it's they are and and they're passing laws trying to make boycott illegal like obviously they're hurting they're seeing that it is having an effect um, and I mean that's why I think that's part of the reason why Netanyahu is getting a little bit more I mean he's, I think he's starting to get a little bit more extreme or at least he's vocalizing it to the public more because he wants to make amends with Obama. Now he's building a, a Palestinian, a, a, a more like 2,200 Palestinian, like a new Palestinian town, which has never happened before. Uh, he's talking about it. And he's talking about uh, you know, other things that are not in. Right, he's, he's a lot. interesting. He's a yeah, 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 interesting. One, one interesting. thing you were talking about, if you want to come down, Jewish Voices for Peace is going to do a big uh, demonstration against the Remax, who is uh, selling or uh, reselling the uh, uh, the apartments in the uh, in the settlements. I don't know when it's going to be, but if you give us your email address, we'll be glad to. Yeah, be. I've read about that. And I know about that. Okay. Then I saw that Remax said, "No, we we don't have anything to do with." Well, they got a Remax right in the West Bank. Yeah, but they said, that's theirs, and don't, 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 don't. Well, but that's like caterpillars, you know? Oh, once we sell it to our retailers, then it's not then it's not in our hands. So Remax is saying the same thing. Oh, they're a subsidiary of us. We don't have anything. It's that part about not taking responsibility. I did just share a story, not a personal story, but a person that went with us on a trip to, uh, uh, to Israel, Palestine, living in Florida, decided to sell our house, and in the neighborhood, there was a real estate agent. Realized that that real estate agent worked for Remax. She came and she talked to her and, and these people, nice, decent people, but had no idea that this went on. But they said, you know, we're willing to, um, we sell, if, we sell, if you sign on with us and sell your house, we will give 1% to, you know, uh, an organization of your choice in Palestine. And she said, I'm sorry, I can't do that. So she, she leaves and she sells her home and she moves to Washington. She's moving to Washington, D.C. She gets another real estate agent who happens to work for Remax. And she says, oh, by the way, do you know what Remax is doing in there? And they're like, woman had no idea. No idea. Interesting, this woman, she said, was an old activist mm -hmm. and said, hmm, when I re-up my license, guess what? I'm not going to be signing up for Remax. So that's Remax a way of saying, I mean, th that's true. Yeah. I would say probably all the Remax or the majority of Remax people have no idea what's going yeah. on. But again, that's your opportunity if you're using somebody yeah. to say, if they came and say, we want to represent you, so I'm sorry, I, I'm not able to use you because this is what is happening. Right. So again, it's, it's all of us who you know, think about when the little kid, when you say, well, I didn't do it because Johnny told me to do it, you know, like that's it. Yeah. So that's yeah. everybody else putting that responsibility on somebody else. Like once it goes out my door, I don't really care what happens about it. Yeah. Okay, Kelly, uh, you want any last statements? I mean, I think that just for other denominations, keep up the good work. I mean, it's a process, it's a journey, and you just said it, we're making more progress, you know, than apartheid in South Africa. Like, we're, we're, so just keep it up. I mean, and let's, you know, let's us locally groups get together and see what we can do. Um, we have Remax here. We have other people here that we could, you can work on engaging noble energies here. So, you know, we just need to go through the process and and keep doing what we're doing. I mean, the, you know, I think, I feel confident that we're getting to a tipping point. Mm -hmm. You know, I think globally, I think globally we are, you know, the movement's definitely picking up steam and. So we just gotta stay strong and we gotta stay diligent and we have to be patient.
Um, you know, this process isn't going to happen in our time. Um, I think it's going to happen in God's time, and we just have to have faith in them. So, um, but I, you know, again, like I said, I wasn't involved in these conversations. So if you guys do have questions, um, you can shoot them to me, and I can shoot them off to the people that were. Um, you know, I like to try and know a lot of people so that I can do these things. So, um, you know, if you have questions for Jeff about writing resolutions, um, you know, because I know Jeff has had a couple of resolutions passed. So if you need advice on, you know, overtures and revolu resolutions and, you know, writing those and taking those to your committees or assemblies or national meetings or synods or whatever, um, you know, I can ask those people. If we want to try and even bring some of those guys out to talk to us about their experience and the journey, I think we could do that too. Um, if you have questions for, like, Machine Frumpke, who's been involved in MRTI, you can email me those questions and I can email them on to her and then just kind of be the middle forwarder. Um, my card's over on the table with all my contact info. Yeah, we just have to keep dropping stones in the pond, trusting yeah. that the ripples are going to wash up change somewhere, <laughs> somehow, sometime, yeah. Yeah. someplace. And so, uh, thank you, Kelly.